If we want to evaluate Bitcoin as objective, yeah. objectively as possible, how do we come over overcome okay. our bias? So let's get to it. Yeah, let's okay. get in. So, um, we we all agree that everyone on any side is li liable or subject to cognitive bias, um, and the cognitive bias often comes from self interest, and so the the shtick is to try to divorce yourself from your self-interest. And the idea is that um, you can imagine a situation. So this is a thought experiment where um, you've taken a pill that has erased temporarily all your personal memories. So you don't know who you are. You don't know um, whether you're male or female. You don't know the, whether you're rich or poor where you live, there's just no personal facts that you remember. But you do have your wits about you and you have at your disposal, you know, all this information and statistics about um, payment networks and how money works, um, um, banking, inflation and all this. All right. And then someone, you know, um, wakes you up in, in, dark, in the dark so you can't like see your own skin and says, hello, you've taken this pill. Um, and uh, we have a choice for you. And the choice is whether or not you'd like one of these two worlds to be actual. And you don't know which one is actual. You don't know which one's the real world. Um, and, but you think that you, like, it's now your responsibility to make one or the other one actual. So what are these two worlds? Um, one world is, is our world. It's the actual world. You just don't know it behind this veil. And then the... The other world is one a lot like ours, but where Bitcoin will never be created, okay, um, for whatever reason. And the task is to decide which world you'd prefer to live in. That's it. Simple. Simple. Which world would you prefer to live in in that kind of situation? So you don't have to import any, like, moral theories. You don't have to import any of your own, like, political views. Uh, definitely not mine. I, I, I'm just saying, here's the framework, here's the choice, um, and maybe here's some data. And so here's um, um, first the, the way that I think you should make the choice, and then, then second, we'll supplement, supplement that um, decision-making framework with some data. So how do we make the choice? So if you're choosing um, which world to actualize and you don't know who you are, um, then the choice involves risk. You don't know you, if you're Pete from Bedford, right. Senator Warren, yeah. or some guy in Bangladesh. Yeah. You could be a prince or you could be a pauper. Yeah. Um, and so when we make decisions like this with risk under uncertainty, uh, most people think that we should consult orthodox decision theory. It's a mathematical framework for how to make decisions like this. And according to this framework, um, you, you are supposed to choose the option which maximizes expected utility. And so the idea would be that um, uh, in any choice, um, you uh, there's a... There's a probability of an outcome and there's like a value for that outcome, like how good it would be. And then the expected value results mathematically from multiplying the probability by the value. So for example, um, I could um, play the lottery, you know? Um, if I win, I, I could get $5 million. But that's a very unlikely outcome. Um, or... I could not play the lottery and save my money. Um, and I think it um, turns out that the decision in this case, which maximizes expected utility for the most part, is to not play the lottery. Because in the vast majority of possibilities, you're just wasting money on the lottery ticket. All right? So this is how orthodox decision theory works. And we can tweak it a little bit so that people can um, import their own kind of... Uh, uh, 
risk function, which is something like a preference for risk. So you can be risk seeking. So um, you can ride a motorcycle. You, you think the enjoyment of riding a motorcycle um, is worth this extra small chance of dying in a horrible accident, you know? You don't ride a motorcycle. No, no, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's unwise. Yeah. You know, um, I think you should not have a risk function that's risk seeking, or at least that risk seeking. Or you can be risk averse. Uh, and I'm more risk averse, and so I would never um, ride a motorcycle. I don't vacation um, in Afghanistan. I don't, you know, jump out of planes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, so everyone can bring their own risk function to the table, their own risk preference. Um, and so, this is a this is very much like a hand wavy uh, heuristic. Of, of course, we can't know like or um, put a number on, uh, the utility or the happiness, you know, on every single person in the world. But, but this is, the, this is the idea. This is a hand wavy heuristic, um, way of thinking about it. So like, um, every person has associated it with them, a kind of utility, a value, uh, philosophers often, often call them utils. Okay. You know, so like, um, uh, my life is pretty good, you know, so maybe my like overall life utility is like 15 utils. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe Adam Back's life is like really, really good. So he has like 30 utils, you know, so this is, and maybe someone who's like really, you know, um, not well off, um, maybe they're homeless um, and they're like really unhappy and desperate. Maybe they have like five utils or something. Like Jeremy over here. <laughs> Uh, and so, um, and so one, one way to make a decision then is, okay, if I'm going to actualize one of these two worlds, I don't know which person I would be in either one of them, then um, what I should do is I, could, I should average out the utilities in each world and see which one has, which, which one would give me the most expected utility. And I think that's basically right, as long as we, you know, take account of the person's risk function. And... Okay, so that's the framework. And now, so, so now you're behind the veil. You don't know who you are, but you know roughly how to make the decision. You have all this empirical data about, um, you know, what the world would be like if you lived in this world rather than that world and how likely it would be you'd have a good or bad life. All right, so now let's input some data. So suppose, um, well, we know actually that in, that in our world and probably then the very similar world without Bitcoin that, uh, that there would be a substantial portion of the population that th don't have access to a banking account. And this is probably around, according to, I think, data, like 2017 data from the World Bank, it's something like um, one, one tenth to one twelfth of the population who don't have access to a bank account for, for bad reasons. You know, like they distrust banks or they live too far from banks or... Um, uh, and so on. It's not just that, like, they don't have enough money. I mean, Bitcoin won't help, help those people. Um, so, so here's the question then. Uh, in either of these worlds, you'd have maybe like a 1 in 12 chance of not having a bank account. Would you rather be in the world without a bank account and then no, having no recourse to anything else? Or would you rather live in the world without a bank account uh, and have recourse to Bitcoin. Okay, so this is a kind of like um, financial or economic Russian roulette. Well, th Which, there's no downside on, on, in one world. Well, that's but the world with, yeah. in this one. The world without. I either have uh, going to one world where there's a uh, one in twelve chance I don't have a, access to a bank account. Yeah, but no upside to that. Right. Whereas the other one, I have a. Yeah, I own. I have. I have the chance. You have a chance. There's, there's no downside. Yeah. So you might think that there are costs um, just associated with having something like Bitcoin. So for example, um, like in, in the world where there's Bitcoin, there's going to be stuff like ransomware. Okay. Okay. Um, another cost, and which is a real cost, is that um, a certain kind of financial intermediaries aren't going to make as much money. 
Okay. Um, but I think the idea is that uh, at least w- if we just zoom in on this one issue about banking, I think most relatively risk averse people would choose to live in the world with something like Bitcoin. Okay. And then you can just keep going down the line. So um, consider inflation. So like something like, I don't know, one-tenth of the, of the world um, lives under uh, runaway inflation. This is terrible. Um, we've kind of gotten a taste of this recently, even um, among us. Um, so, well, I think right now it's going to be way higher than one-tenth. Yeah. yeah. I thought, thought the statistic in your paper was higher. In I, the paper it was... Um, one in eight live under double digit inflation, but okay. again, it might have gone up. But I also think the I also thought the number without banking was high. I thought it was like thirty percent. No, that was one in twelve. That was one in twelve. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would have said now. CPI figures, maybe. Yeah. If we say double digit inflation is yeah. the runaway number. Yeah. But I would say those numbers are fake, and I would yeah. say nearly all of the world is now living under double digit inflation. Yeah, that seems right to Real me too. World. Yeah. Um, and so. Yeah. And some people have it worse, you know, yeah. there's, a, yeah, there's a spectrum. Digit. Yeah, exactly. And so would you rather live in a world with um, inflation or would you rather live in a world with inflation, but you have the chance to own uh, an asset with a limited supply, a finite supply, of, like, you know, a cap and uh, and one that's, desired partially for this reason um well i think i know what i would choose i would choose the one where i'd have recourse where i'd have an escape hatch um so that i could put put in store and save some of my money um for the long term in a way that won't just melt away and i think that most relatively risk averse people would choose the same and so the idea in, in this paper is to um, go through these issues and ask, would you, would you like the Bitcoin world or would you like to live in the non-Bitcoin world? And people can bring their own moral theories, they can bring their own political theories um, and values, and they can bring their own risk function to the table. But I do think if most people are suitably informed and honest with themselves, I think that they would want to to have the extra help that Bitcoin offers. So I was listening to a podcast um, not too long ago with Elise Colleen. Yep. And she called Bitcoin fintech for poor people. Like, that's brilliant. That is brilliant. Um, And I think that's exactly right and why I could make an argument like this. So especially if you're relatively well off, in like global terms, going through this kind of thought experiment can help you imagine yourself in someone else's shoes. Because you look at the statistics, and then um, what the framework is helpful for is that it it doesn't actually tell you what to decide. It just says if you input certain data, it will spit out a certain value about what you should choose. And, uh, and there, there's so much compelling data about how the global poor could be helped by something like Bitcoin that I do think the truth is that Bitcoin is overall good because partially most people would want to live in a world with it because it it would help them. So that's fine because they're those binary options. Uh, but I actually also like the bit in there where there's like the risk analysis between who I could be yeah. and who I most likely would be. Yeah, good. So this is where the expected value stuff comes in. So um, there are just many, many more people who aren't wealthy than people <laughs> that there are. And so um, I, I really do see the choice as a kind of, um, economic Russian roulette, and I think that most most people would realize that they would more likely be someone who's not privileged, and so they'd like to have recourse in those kinds of situations. And so I, 
I, I, I really do think that if you're, you know, a disinterested, honest, genuine outsider, that if you're familiar with this kind of framework, then yeah, you'd say, okay, yeah, I, I guess I don't really have much of a problem with Bitcoin and I can even see why it's a good thing to have around. It's a bit like uh, those who are near the spigot right now yes. don't don't tend to care, or actually probably anti-Bitcoin because it's a threat to them. But if you put them in that scenario where there's a one in 10 chance that you're going to be poor and not have access to banking, uh, there's only a one in much higher number, like a thousand, whatever that number is, to being yeah. close to the spigot. Yeah. Which one are you going to take? Now, in the reality of the world they're in, mm -hmm. they have no need to care. That they're, they're self-interested in staying near the spigot and fuck everyone else. Sure. Um, so I I see the kind of decision framework or thought experiment, as I've set it up, as a way to build out Alice Gladstein's like check your privilege yeah. slogan. And so what the thought experiment encourages you to do is to leave your privilege at the door and then you go in behind the veil and then you conduct the equation <laughs> more or less well and it was really helpful to see that point where you said if you're a wealthy person not all the time but you're yeah. generally more likely to want to vote for less tax and if you're a yes. poor person you're most likely to want to vote for more welfare but if you are a poor person who wins the lottery you suddenly might flip to want to vote for less tax. Yeah, lotteries provide a nice insight into our self-interest. And the self-interest is strong. It's not just that um, you know, poor people favor policies that favor the poor and wealthy people favor policies that favor the wealthy. It's that even wealthy people, if they had been poor, would have favored policies that favor the poor. And poor people, if they had been rich in that situation, would have favored policies that favored the rich. So, so um, wherever your status goes, your interest follows. Yeah. Yeah. And you want to protect that status. And lotteries are neat because we sometimes see these overnight changes of status. And um, there have been some studies conducted on how this affects people's policy or um, preferences about like tax policies and things. And um, it's not surprising that if you're previously poor and you win the lottery and now you're not poor anymore, but extremely wealthy, that all of a sudden you would want to protect that wealth and not to have, not have to fritter away in taxes.